Hey, and welcome back to the Guardian Project Podcast. This is episode 86, and I'm your host, Andy and Coyle. Do you know why I don't post things on Reddit? No, I do not. Because I don't want to provoke the trolls. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, nice. New call time card, relevant to today. That's nice. GameStop. I don't own any. Stonks are up. But I've been told GameStop is a good company now. Mm. <laughs> the stock is good. <laughs> <laughs> I actually am building that Svela deck. I finished the deck list today. I was pretty excited. About oh, that. very good. Yeah. And I am your other host, Mike Coyle. And um, Andy, do you know what this episode uh, has in common with every single commander that you play? Uh, I am here. No, you got to 86 that. You got to 86 that commander. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Please listen carefully. I need to cut all my commanders? Is that what you're saying? No, right I now? need to remove them. I need to remove them from all the board. All of my commanders? Every time they hit the board. That's a big compliment. That's a really good compliment. You gotta, you gotta Even get rid like of them. Even like Noyan Dar, you gotta remove it. You know? Well, that, yeah. is, that is actually true, You gotta though. remove them all. You gotta remove them all. That's true. And this is the podcast where we talk about all things Magic the Gathering. But mostly Commander. So, um, Arena is now on mobile for some folks. Mm -hmm. It's not on iOS yet. Nope. But um, I will say the first uh, the first couple of images that I saw of Arena online were of just a bunch of scoots. Forms. Yeah, yeah. People got to test it. I heard it hasn't been too terrible though. It's, like playing on on mobile, mm -hmm. it's um it 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 just launched on January twenty eighth, so uh, just a couple of days ago. Apparently, my uh, my note is too archaic to download Arena onto it. I think I have the Note 7 or the Note 8 or something like that. You need like Note 10 minimum. There is actually in the announcement, there is a list of supported devices, but I don't have an Android. I have an iPhone. So, right. and ours isn't planned. The, the iOS release is not planned until later this year. Well, that's better than when it got released on Apple. Didn't it take like two years to release on Apple after it released on Windows? Oh, for, for yeah, the full blown yeah. arena. It, it was a long time. Yeah. A lot of people had to play on just PCs that were not really <laughs> up to par to support Arena. You For wouldn't sure. think that it needed that much uh, support. Oh, the graphics are so good. No, they actually are very yeah. good. It just there were a lot of people who were like, "Well, I want a Mac, so I guess I'm going to use this <laughs> old laptop that I had from 14 years ago, and it's not up to par." Guess I'll just play MTGO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, it, it says that the the early access and open testing is happening right now, and uh, their goal is to release on additional devices as soon as they're ready. Um, and that we should expect to learn more about what's next on the mobile launch plans uh, with the release of Strixhaven. So okay. we know okay. Caldheim releases this week. The pre-release was this past weekend. Mm -hmm. Did you get any pre-release kits or anything? I did. I bought a couple pre-release kits uh, when I was at one of my one of our LGSs picking up some singles. I thought, hey, I'll pick up a couple pre-release kits. Uh, best card I opened was the extended art foil Kaya. Oh, nice. That was a good pull. That's yeah. a great pull. Everything else, I mean, I pulled like I've been. I was specifically trying to get cards for my Morophon Changeling Tribal deck because I can't uh, purchase those singles from LGSs until the set is officially released on Friday. Yeah. Um. But I figured, oh, maybe for our Thursday stream, we can rule zero and it can be legal for me to play these cards. So I did pull a couple of, of the course. cards. I did pull a couple of the cards that I I needed for the deck. So that was fun, like a Mask Wood Nexus. So. I was able to open, um, I guess, the the big card that I opened was the Borderless Velky that flips in mm. the Tybalt. So it's mm -hmm. got that alternate artwork. It's not the showcase one. Okay. And I guess I didn't even recognize or or I didn't look into all the alternate arts. I mean, I like usually the showcase borders mm -hmm. in most of these sets, but that one is really creepy. His teeth are real gross. Oh, yeah. Velky's teeth are real gross. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then Tybalt's teeth are like perfect. Are they? I, I don't know if I looked at I just looked at Velky's side and I was like, you could use a good brushing. Yeah. I mean, floss maybe. will do some wonders. That's what his dentist at the end of every single cleaning says. Do you floss? Do you and it's floss? A, you, everyone knows that it's like, it's not a real question. Like, you could see. Doctor, you're the professional here. <laughs> you know what you see. I don't like using regular floss. I use either floss tape or I have those little, I don't know how to explain what they are. They look like. It's the pick, and at the end, it's got the little piece of the... the yeah, like to the individual floss stick Stick, things. and you bite down on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's way easier. Those things are genius. <laughs> you ever think about creating something and then, like making a lot of money, and you're like, everything's been created? No. The guy was like, no, 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 no. I can improve floss. Yeah. That's great. An engineer that is also a dentist, probably, somewhere. 
<laughs> so I have a kind of a funny story. Okay. Um, this Saturday morning, I was able to go get a haircut for the first time in like two or three months or something like that because I'm a monster caveman okay. who doesn't get his haircut very often. And it was in the morning. And I never wake up in the morning on the weekends right now. Um, you saw you saw like the sunrise. I saw that I did not see the sunrise. This was 10 in the morning. When I say morning, it's like for some people, that's already afternoon. Some people were winding down for bed by 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I have my haircut at 10 a.m. And I decided since I was already out, I was like, oh, I'm going to go to one of my LGSs and pick up these last few singles that I needed and blah, blah, blah. And I made my way over there and I didn't realize um, that this one LGS uh, doesn't open till noon. And so I, I, had I don't to, think any of ours really open. Uh, one might open at 11. Yeah. So I had to turn around and go home and then I ended up going back to the LGS. Was it later the far one yeah. over by me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's what a 20 minute drive for you. Probably 15. It's probably 20. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it wasn't too bad. And I was able to pick up the last few cards that I needed for my Morophon um, Changelings deck there, like my Liliana's Contract and my Knight's Charge, which are really, really cool with Changelings. Uh, I do I do need a few cards uh, from you if you open them in your pre-release, like Mistwalker and Rampage of the Valkyries. Is Mistwalker the green? Mistwalker is a uh, blue flying Changeling at common, and Rampage of the Valkyries is an uncommon uh, like grave pack, but specifically for angels. Oh, okay. I don't know if I opened it. It's entirely possible. Perfect. I will take a look for you. <laughs> um, we also, there was an announcement for Secret Layer Ultimate Edition 2. So um, mm -hmm. it'll be available May 7th at WPN stores around the world. It is featuring 10 full art pathway lands in premium foil with brand new art from uh, some of Magic Best's artists. So it includes the six pathway lands from Zendikar Rising featuring, show, uh, I guess, showcasing art from, uh, or I guess, art design for Kaldheim. And then the four pathway lands in Kaldheim featuring art from Zendikar instead. Um, so if you are looking to pick up these lands, you know, this is one of those, does this feel a little cash grabby? Yes. Uh, not a little. I, I would I would I would stand on the soapbox and say this is very cash grabby. Yeah, I like these aren't really like I don't know if these cards are I mean, at least for commander wise, I don't I don't I, I replace like a guild gate with these. Sure. But even I mean, it's just they're changing like just the plane that the land is on. And it's I mean, they're it's beautiful art. Absolutely beautiful art. I just don't see someone going, Oh, I need all five colors of my double-faced lands to be all from Zendikar or I need them all to be from Kaldheim. I'm curious to see how much these cost. I like if like aftermarket? Is, is this going to cost as much as the fetch land ultimate edition? Oh, that. Like that. Okay. Because that was the first ultimate edition. True. And there were... I sure hope not. There's not. I would sure hope not. Yeah. If it is, then well, I mean, I didn't buy the fetch land one, but... Well, I wanted to, but I did I did not. Not, no. for, not for that price. No. That no. was a little... Bit expensive. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and then the other item is there was an update to EDA Tracks website. Actually, it came out today. Um, so I think the biggest thing there's there's a whole video, so you can go check it out. Um, they've added a lot of features, and I guess one of the largest or the biggest requests that they had gotten was that they wanted a full ranked list of the commanders from like number one to the last commander all so, the way all the way down so you can you can see that so i went through and um because uh, i had to check out my noyan dar deck and where it stands and so uh it's ranked 280 okay so i'm uh i'm still at the near the front of the pack there um and <laughs> zhang liao is is last which one's zhang liao it's a three three for six that says when it deals damage to a player it's like four colorless black black when it deals combat damage to an opponent, like they discard a card or something. Okay. So it's dead last. I'm it's, surprised it is last though. That, wait, that probably, ability doesn't seem terrible. Probably because it's a portal three kingdoms card. I or think something. the last two are both portal yeah, three kingdoms. So I think it's like an $80 card. Yeah. So it's a whole accessibility behind it. Yeah. Hey, you know what we get to start doing on Wednesdays or at least this Wednesday and then maybe monthly, probably not weekly what play dungeons and dragons that is true we are going to be doing that outside of our magic the gathering world that's right except it will be inside a magic the gathering world yeah well it's not <laughs> <Ravnica. laughs> <laughs> does my character have a name i didn't name my character yet but i'm a rakdos character so that's kind of cool part of the the ju jury's review yeah that's right you're I'm a, a puppeteer a puppeteer and we'll see how puppeteer 
you are or how puppeteered you are you're gonna make me cry you're, no my puppet will cry <laughs> your puppet will cry dude that's talent <laughs> you can make your hands sweat to the point where your puppet has tears that's a lot of work that would be impressive though very impressive top top notch top tier top tier and if you want to be top tier top tier i i know that's amazing <laughs> like a cry. that was so good you ruined my transition <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to be top tier you can become one of our patrons which <laughs> which have many tiers for you to choose from <laughs> And you can support us at any dollar amount over at patreon.com slash guardian project pod. And if you're looking for another way to support the podcast, the easiest way, whatever you're listening to the podcast on now, are you listening on Spotify? Hit us with a follow and a like, leave a comment, if you're listening on YouTube and watching. You can subscribe and hit that bell icon. There's so many different ways and we want your comments and your feedback in order to make this podcast better for you. Coil, what are we talking about? This week. This week we're talking about a little thing called meta or your meta game. So uh, we're going to talk about how, you know, the different uh, environments and people you play with affect your strategies and cards that you use in your decks. Let's, uh, l- logic? No. What's the word we would use for meta? That's so meta, but. Yeah, that's so meta. It really is. What's the meta way of saying that's so meta? You just don't say anything at all. You just, and? Do you ever think about our our transition music? Like you think about the Friends theme song and you just clap. I we have before, yeah. You you kind of have to. It's yeah. just it's kind of the thing you have to do. If you're listening at home and you don't clap, what about what about an MJR? Because it's more fun at MJR. Yeah, that's a, I, is, is I'm that a regional sure, theater? I'm pretty sure that's a Michigan theater, <laughs> and so uh, like AMC is is AMC national? Uh, AMC is national, yes, okay. and they're and they're trading very well in the stock market right now. Oh, we're we're coming three sixty already I today. Mean, I mean, you mentioned AMC. Now you know? I gotta know <laughs> is MJR? Uh, it's MJR Digital Cinemas National. Let's look that up real quick because there is a theme that says it's more fun at MJR, but you do always have to prepare for the clap. Yeah, it's more than just a good night out. Clap, clap. <laughs> um, I, uh, I don't know if it is. I don't. Well, it, for all all you out there that don't have the opportunity to clap before your movie starts at MJR, I feel sorry for you. It says a it's a bit. movie theater chain in the Detroit area with ten theaters. That's so, it. Only ten. Wow. It, they're like all in our area. <laughs> wow. I feel special. There are like four or five right in our area. So you definitely have no idea what we're talking about right now. But it and is, you're welcome. it's more fun at MJR because that is, that is their theme song. So we are talking <laughs> about metagaming this week. So Coil, metagaming. It's, a, it's an interesting concept, but really mm-hmm. in Commander, it's much different than other formats because it's like predicting how others are going to make decisions based on their personality or previous decisions or what you like or or what commander they chose and, and determining how you're going to build a deck or play against them. Mm -hmm. Um, But in commander, it's not really like a sanctioned format. Like there's no, it, it, you're not going in with a set of rules that you have to abide by mm-hmm. and a set of cards that are only legal here and you know that, you know, Kaladesh has a lot of artifacts, you're going to run a lot of artifact removal. You know, right. it's not it's not like that. Right. So we're talking about how to understand your metagame and how to, I guess, play for it. Right. So, so your metagame is developed with a few different characteristics um, or your meta. it's your environment is a big thing and the people that you're playing with are absolutely the two biggest parts of the metagame and whether that is your local play group of three other people that you play with whether it's your local game store that you compete at uh weekly during commander leagues or something um going to grand prix i forget honestly um is probably more stressful than our streams to be fair because i'm actively trying to win in league 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and the, and, and, and of course we don't know if there's like a right or a wrong way to do this here. Right. These are, these are all of the stuff we're going to talk about today is really based on our opinions and what we've seen before mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, and what we think are the do's and don'ts of, of metagaming for sure. Because there's certainly things that, that we, I mean, we've said before, it's like, oh, I guess I'm not going to do that because it kind of hurts something too much. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, you you kind of you, you started off there with with determ- determining how you're going to play based on who you're playing with, right? So you have your local play group. That's kind of your first group, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, we we know what each other play a lot. And right. I used to start playing cards that would exile your graveyard. That's right. Because I was like coils. It doesn't matter what we were doing. Like when we first started, you were always playing like, I'm going to throw this card in the graveyard. I'm going to reanimate it the next turn. I was like, I guess I got to run all the effects that remove individual cards. Like scavenging ooze was really good against you for a long time. Yes, it was. Although you've moved away from that strategy like heavily. Yeah, I don't really. There's only like one deck that really plays with the graveyard a lot. And that was my Kenrith deck, to be fair. And well, that, that and successful. your zombies deck, but you don't True. play it as often. So True. you've got like two decks, that, but you have not played with them in a long time. Right. And we, we don't t- get together in person to play anymore. So mm-hmm. we, we are only playing online. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think games go a lot faster when you're in person. So that that could be also a determining factor. But I didn't want to do things like that when I knew, well, Coil literally his only strategy is throw something in the graveyard. Like your Scarab God deck. And he was like, if I just pick apart the graveyard, he's not going right. to do a whole lot. Because that's what I was trying to do is pick apart the graveyard. with that On deck. your own. Yeah, exactly. But put him back. I wanted them to just go away. Well, Scarab God exiles them. But Yes. Oh, that's true. But if I get him first. If you get him first, then I got nothing. <laughs> got him. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, these these different strategies and, um, you know, even um, if you're going up against someone that, that plays, you know, a lot of control or board wipe and stuff, then maybe you're going to sprinkle some protection into your deck because of that. Um, where normally you win or extra protection, I should say. You should always have some sort of protection for your creatures in your deck unless you want them to die, I suppose. Yeah, like cards. I mean, I know that people have have said that it was good to play cards against me specifically for a while there that were like, you can only play spells at sorcery speed. Mm -hmm. You know, like the Teferi, I think it's what, Mage of Mm Zelfir was really good because uh, my Noyan Dardic plays pretty much like solely at instant speed. Right. I mean, there are some sorceries, of course. But um, if I saw that thing come down, I was like, oh, uh oh, this is actually a big problem for me. Right. Yeah, if they can specifically... Um, like target a strategy of yours, but make sure that it's, you know, something that we are going to talk about later. Make sure it's not a dead card because making some, making everyone play at sorcery speed is always going to be good for you as long as it doesn't also affect you at sorcery speed. Uh, even it just particularly shuts down the strategy that you were playing. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I run, I I run, we have some other people that play with instant sorceries, Mm -hmm. I guess just specifically instant speed or flash. Mm -hmm. And if they can't cast things, uh, at instant speed or flash, that's a, that's a big old bummer. Right. Like my Yeva deck, which is literally the whole thing. It's just green creatures at flash speed. Green creatures. Yeah. At the end of your, your last player, your last opponent's end step. Exactly. Yeah. So we have developed specific things that we know that we do don't do in our play group just Mm -hmm. because we know that that's the way that, that someone likes to play. And we don't want to completely shut it down. However, if you're playing to win, mm-hmm. you know exactly how to play against me. And I I don't know exactly anymore because you've been building decks that don't quite fit your wheelhouse I've anymore. I've been trying to change it up to throw everyone off. <laughs> I have learned, though, that I just like playing combos. So if you can dis- just disrupt that. Like, yeah. If you watched our stream th- this past week... Um, I was playing Gerard Golgari Lichlord mm-hmm. and Chris from CNC Power Hour was on. And after I took out Coil and um, Nick mm-hmm. uh, at the exact same time, or no, Coil and Max. Yeah. Um, Nick was the, pre- the, the previous week. Right, right, right. Um, after I took Coil and Max uh, from Commander Central out, they turned my, my Gerard into a forest. <laughs> That's right. The last remaining player in the game, uh, Chain, Chain of Command, turned it into a forest. Nope, nope. nope. It was Chris from CNC Power Hour. Oh, Nick and Chain was the previous week. We have oh, too many streams. Sorry. We just posted those videos going live today. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris from CNC Power Hour turned it into, it was Song of the Dryads, right on my Gerard. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, I don't have any, I have an answer for it. Yeah, I mean, you have enchantment removal I have somewhere. enchantment removal in both green and black now. Mm-hmm. And uh, didn't draw either of them. But it felt really good taking two players out with 24 fling damage yeah. in a single turn. 
Yeah, I died. I died in that moment. I don't even remember what deck I was playing at the time. Yeah, so I've been playing a lot of combos, <laughs> and the way to stop me is taking out one piece of it, and the draw deck is simply a combo deck. Right. I mean, even if it's not an infinite, just reanimating and flinging like three times will just do it. So mm -hmm. um, he had the answer, which was turning it into a forest. That's right. Take out the command. What remember I said in my intro. You got an 86 that commander. That's and a point that we're going to make later is that I build around my commander a lot. You, you do. Know? Yeah. So now moving from your local play group to your LGS. Yeah, I think so when we first started playing uh, commander together, commander wasn't a, a league or anything at our local game stores. It was a casual format to play, you know, between standard rounds on FNM or on Sundays. You know, they had they started putting together but Sundays where you got donuts for free. That's true. And you just played two rounds. That's that was right. fun. And you got five dollar store credit if you want a pod. Right. So um, you know, and then these the the popularity of Commander just grew and grew and grew, still growing today. Um, and we got to see leagues. There was a league at the one LGS that I didn't frequent very much already going on. And then a league started at the other LGS that I did frequent a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and our decks changed because we are now building to win the game and to accumulate points based on different things you can do within the game. Yeah, and we've talked about that in a couple of our episodes. We, and we had um, Judge Anthony on many, many months ago. Mm -hmm. um, sometime, it was, it was earlier last year, um, talking about leagues and points. And I think we even posted... Uh, one of our league sheets, you could see exactly what points we were trying to get. But yeah, our decks changed a lot because now there was something other than just playing some crazy cards or playing, you know, a Dapala vehicle deck, which is a very fun deck, but not necessarily competitive. Right. Um, you enjoy getting crushed by the weather light and by all those. You're like, oh, well, yeah, the <laughs> Sky Sovereign flagship or whatever just did it to me. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Big time. <laughs> yeah. But then we built some pretty strong decks right. because the problem there was we went from not caring about winning to playing the most competitive version of a commander you could build. Right. Even if it wasn't, I mean, CEDH, it was, I mean, it was just competitive, you know, the C being just competitive, not, not the highest tier of competitive. Right. Like a, like a, like a level eight is probably what you would call it. Just, just, I don't even know if it was, I don't know if anybody uh, listening to our show would call Narset Enlightened Master uh, an eight, but it might be a nine. It was not. It was. It was fun for me, sure. Uh, but I do feel bad for the people that watched me take six turns. <laughs> and at one point, I had an Eldrazi conscription. You know, and I was like, well, okay. And then you got them. And then the meta changed. <laughs> That's right. And then they they changed. Uh, it was really interesting to see the adaptation of the rules and how you could accumulate points in the league. Um, change so that you would change different strategies that you use in your deck. Like uh, you got negative points if you had uh, infinite uh, triggers or infinite mana or something. Um, you could still win and get points. You just wouldn't get as many points for doing that. So um, winning a game in a quote unquote more fair way. And again, I'm saying that in quotes, uh, magic's fair all the way is my opinion. But, um, you know, winning in these quote unquote more fair ways, you could accumulate more points in the league. And so you change your strategy to be the most efficient, but within this rule set. Um, and I thought that was really interesting for deck building. Yeah, there were, I mean, and then after the first week or two, you saw what the other people were playing. And um, like there were some group hug decks with the philosophy of you concede. Mm -hmm. um, so you you kind of ramp everybody and go crazy. But like there was some philosophy. I don't know where it came from. I don't know if it's an R area thing or if it's an overall area thing. Mm -hmm. But it's like you don't kill the group hug player. And then they were accumulating all these points because they were like, well, I'm the group hug player. Mm -hmm. It's like but you're winning this whole league because no one will kill you. Right. They'll Which get... was a great strategy for the meta because th th these everybody realized, oh, well, they're being nice. They're giving me 14 cards per turn and tripling my mana. Just take them out. <laughs> yeah. No, you should <laughs> always take out the group hug player. But yeah, they would always get second place and then get the points for like saving someone's life or something because they had a fog somewhere random. And that was enough to accumulate more points than the person who got first place a lot of the times. Yeah. So um, specifically playing to for those 
little interactions in the game was another big part of our local meta um, that developed our deck building. And we wouldn't like go from the LGS back home and go, oh, I got to take out these 10 cards and put in these other 10 cards. Like, no, I'm just going to play the deck that I played at the, mm-hmm. at the game store. So uh, it changed our, our permanent deck build but i do change out in many instances even for our stream i will take out the fast mana sure it's sometimes it's just too much like Mm -hmm. the locust god deck is already strong but when you get to add mana vault and mana crypt and grim monolith and you know and you just you add all the really efficient stuff Mm -hmm. um it can be just a little too good too fast um but when someone says they want to play a high power game i'm fine with that then bring it on out yeah so um, we had that. And then when you add in prizes and non, you know, prizes specifically, mm-hmm. um, like the league, it it makes it even more cutthroat. And it didn't gradually change from being casual to competitive. I mean, it went from casual to the most competitive that I've seen. Mm-hmm. There were mono blue Venser decks, mm-hmm. mono black. It, it was very, it was extremely combo oriented. Mm-hmm. I think almost every deck there was combo was it um commander 2019 release with like anya falcon wrath was that 2019 there were i mean at at some point during the leagues i think we competed in like four or five of them no i mean the pre-con that came out in 2019 right the anya falcon wrath pre-con what it i think mm, it was c19 not c18 c18 was the planeswalkers right I think so. Anyway, in the that, Anya, the Anya precon, <laughs> the year that that released, one of our local game stores did an EDH tournament where uh, you played in a few different pods, and then the final pod, the first place of that pod, got to pick which one of the decks they wanted for free, and then it went down from there. You know, second pick, third pick, fourth yeah, pick, yeah, yeah. And that particular day was when everyone pulled out their absolute 100%. See, we had like Doomsday Zer at the same table as Consultation Cast, and I know you had your Locust God deck there. And <laughs> I got wiped the first round I, because I did not go high enough because you crashed. <laughs> I, I, I consoled the the demonics on that one. I was very sad because I had a counter spell. And I had a counter for the counter spell. Yeah, it was so close. It was. It was really close. I emptied my hand. It took everything, but Anya Falcon Wrath is 2019. Yes. Okay. So, um, so, and I mean, people that I've never played a competitive game with before, like that high tier game, they all brought a deck there because it was the stakes are high. The stakes are for it, this 40 the stakes are high for a 40 card, <laughs> a $45 40 dollar dollar. deck. <laughs> yeah. Compared to the normal $5 in store credit that you would, that you would normally get. Yeah. But, um, so, you know, that changed up a lot. And, you know, speaking of prizes, we also have uh, Magic Fest, formerly Grand, Grand Prix, mm-hmm. that also had Commander at it. And I know the first time that we did it, um, you know, there was a little bit of a discussion before, but everyone seemed to be playing pretty high powered decks because they wanted to get the, the tickets and they wanted to win. But then when we went to Command Fest Chicago, there was a tier system of casual, competitive, casual, and competitive, which, you know, most people, I would say, probably followed the rules most, on that one. Most did, yes. Um, and so it was good to actually see that you could, no matter what deck you you played or what decks you brought, you could find a, a play group to play with at your power level. Yeah, no, that was a lot of fun. Um, and there were some people that were metagaming, mm-hmm. but bringing it back to its commander and we don't really have an organized play structure, you're just trying to play to all of your weaknesses, right? right? So if you know that you are particularly weak to, I don't know, artifact removal you play things that are going to give your artifacts indestructible Mm -hmm. or i guess maybe you have a color where you can use counterspell Mm -hmm. now i think folks are potentially using partner commanders because they can add in a color to a strategy that they wanted to use previously that gives them the ability to add counter spells i don't know i mean malcolm i don't know if malcolm's being used just as a color but i would assume in some instances people might go well i can use blue so i'll add this or i'll add elegith or Mm -hmm. you know whatever it is to get blue and you're like well i'm gonna use my counter spells now right and counter spells being a catch-all uh that can counter any type of spell that's going to be targeting your stuff you know nothing um specifically for like oh some i'm playing graveyard i'm gonna bring in a piece of graveyard hey it's like no you want maybe you want to bring in something modal then because you don't want it to be a dead card rest in peace is one of those cards that i think is if you don't particularly care about your graveyard Mm -hmm. and you feel like 
or and you have maybe some enchantment strategy uh, or or synergy at all, it might not be a bad card to throw in. Right. But if if you don't have anything to do with it and you're just throwing it in to throw it in, it might not always be the best play because not everybody plays in the graveyard. However, if you do get paired up with that person who is playing the Scarab God and you're like, well, I guess we just play this rest in peace on turn two and hope for the best the rest of the game, you know? Yeah, well, I can even like, you know, everyone who's played green is probably playing an Eternal Witness. So you're going to be shutting down an Eternal Witness every game, hopefully, luckily. <laughs> luckily. <laughs> if, if, if they have it and they play it and you go, oh, Nothing in your graveyard. Yeah, you make a good point, right? So now the other thing to consider in Commander is that there are a lot of cards that people quote unquote consider staples. Mm -hmm. You just see them a lot, right? You know, it's not even that they 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 have to be in every deck. It's that they just they they generically fit decks because you can get card like Eternal Witness is very good in mm -hmm. in green. Mm -hmm. Just you're like, well, I guess I could use another card that I had used previously in my graveyard. Let me just get it back. Um, I don't play Eternal Witness in every green deck I have, but I play it in a in a bunch yeah a lot of them for me it probably is every single one you think so i i think so maybe maybe not a budget deck because the eternal witnesses maybe like two or three dollars it might be even five dollars by this point so maybe not in a budget deck but that's about it yeah i don't know if i played in every but again i think i've started to move away from just always playing staples. for sure for sure um but that is a that is a really good card to get to get cards back um but you know playing you know, odd cards is also very interesting. You know, mm -hmm. and you're like, well, I used this previously. I guess I need the eternal ways to get it back because I'm afraid they're just going to do it again, mm -hmm. you know, depending on whatever commander they're playing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're new to a play group coil. Yes. How do you figure out the meta game? Uh, there's this really great thing called the rule zero where you talk to people before you start playing a game. Um, you can uh, hover for a while and just see how people are playing games uh, before you start throwing in a group. Um, but you know we're we're playing online now, and uh, our our meta our meta game our local play group is now like an international play group, and uh, you just kind of have to play it by ear. Yeah, the pregame chat is for for real a thing you got to do now. Mm -hmm. You know what's so funny is I one of the New Year's resolutions was to have more thoughtful pregame chats, mm -hmm. right? And I've been doing this. However, I I feel like now um and there's been a lot of discussion in our Discord about it and people are saying, you know, maybe I shouldn't have to share every single silver bullet that's in my deck mm -hmm. um in the pregame. And I was a huge um opponent of hull breacher in okay. the beginning of the year i just was i mean i i don't want to get you know i don't want to have hull breacher played against me right so i probably won't play it against anybody else and if i'm playing it i i just you know i, I generically think i just feel bad because i want everyone to have a good time so i i share oh just so you know there's a hull breacher in my deck and um from what i've noticed so far is you get targeted just because you said you have two or three cards mm -hmm. um and other people just didn't share what they have in their deck. Right. And so now I'm trying to figure out how to walk that fine line between oh. what do you share? What do you not share? And I also think that I, um, way overestimate my power level now compared mm. to what I play against when I say I'm playing at like a seven and I see someone else's seven. I was like, Oh, am I not at a seven? Hmm. I don't know. I can't figure it out yet. Okay. But so it's also, you know, grain of salt. That sure. pregame chat for sure for is sure. going to be very, very different. And I know that I've been listening to a couple of shows recently, specifically uh, Commander Crunch podcast. Mm -hmm. They just had scrap, the Scrap Trawlers on, Andy mm -hmm. and Nick were on, and they were talking about um, some, some pregame chat stuff as well and not expecting to get taken out by a crater hoof when you said you're playing a Power 5 game. Okay. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, I didn't anticipate that in a five. Right. In a, f a five, which is what? It, five is supposed to be pre-cons, right? I, I think I don't. You Maybe know, it's I, upgraded pre-cons. I don't, I don't think it's upgraded. I think a pre-cons at like, I think a pre-cons five, okay. you okay. know, and it's like, I did not expect that. Um, so um, that's a very hard determinant, just those, but they, it's, an, it's a necessary, uh, a necessary part of the game. Right. I think the staples argument or not the staples. I, I think the specific cards argument is going to be difficult because people do get scared of individual cards. Yep. But like I'm, I'm, I'm going to have this rule zero conversation with you on, on Thursday or maybe before that. Hey Andy, I have a changelings deck. No. Could you not play your salamanders deck that prevents all damage from all of my changelings? 
okay. against me. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Hey, look at that rule zero conversation <laughs> just now. That was great. Yeah, that that pregame chat of me not playing uh, Gore Maldrak. Yes, that's uh, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. I will not. Man, that's really good though. Yeah, but now if I, if say, I anticipate changeling decks, I'm gonna play Gore Maldrak. Yeah. Now. <laughs> now, if I say, oh, I'm playing my Svela deck, uh, just so you know, it's got three Eldrazi in it. Are you gonna target me first? No, not until you have too much mana. That's right. Then, then you go hard <laughs> on those icy manoliths. Is that what they are? Are they icy manoliths? Yes. I forget what Svella makes. Icy manoliths. I, I opened, uh, like, I also opened some pre-release kits of Keller, um, called Heim, so mm -hmm. I saw I saw some of those tokens. I, I really was just racking my head around how to build around the icy manoliths in Gruul. Can't figure it out other than token strategies. Just, we'll get there. I mean, it gives you mana. That's pretty much how I'm playing it. You only need a couple of weeks. You know, you're going to, you're, you're, it's going to be a little light bulb. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This commander's not as good as I thought. Dang it. No. No. Nope. You said it's the top command, best, top best rule. commander of all time. All time. So getting back to staples, you said decks, you know, play a lot of staples. And, um, you know, another good point is decks are really never finished. Um, and so you may have some staples now, but there might be some new staples that come out. I think one of the most recent one that comes to mind is like Dockside Extortionist was heavily adopted in both casual and competitive. Mm -hmm. It's just really good. Um, within the last, you know, year or two, um, Dockside Extortionist has kind of hit, hit the tables. Was that 2019 as well? Uh, Dockside Extortionist was in the Mystic Intellect deck from 20, 2019. Yeah. Yeah. 2019 savine savine and that is that's just a creature so i think that one yep. is 20 yeah i think it was 2019 so yep. um when dockside extortion is kind of uh i don't know if that or at least my my recognition 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 Recog no we're gonna go with it recognition <laughs> <laughs> That the recognition <laughs> of dockside extortionists that's not a word it is now it is now Dictionary. Add it to the dictionary. <laughs> Dictionary.com, Wikipedia. Oh my God. I was saying recognized and realization at the same time. Mm -hmm. Recognition. Recognition. Oh, well, that was embarrassing. What was your recognition about Dockside Extortion? It was really good. What was it? <laughs> when I was able to bounce it like six times, oh, that yeah. one game was, that was really cool. Oh yeah. That was really cool. So when I recognitioned it, it was <laughs> really, it was really great. Um, anyway, that, that card is, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily in, it's not in every, but I'm seeing it more and more and more often now. Right. And it's like, well, if that red deck is playing all of, all of those artifacts, maybe I, maybe I do run an artifact removal spell. Maybe I run an, a, a Vandal Blast just because it doesn't hurt. But in some cases, if people aren't playing with artifacts, mm -hmm. it's like this card doesn't do anything at all. Yeah. Well, and you got to be careful if someone else plays a Dockside Extortionist and then just doubles up on your mana. Too. I mean, nah. <laughs> I guess if you're playing to your meta game and everybody's playing Dockside, you might as well just play Dockside. You gotta play your Dockside. You guys, you might as well just play Dockside. You, you have to. I guess you have to now. But it, it was really cool when that card came out. How it it didn't warp, but it helped like the competitive scene, and then just became a really good card, even just to play casually. And cards like that are kind of my favorite type of cards. And Maybe Hall Breacher is trying to be that card, a card you can play competitively, but maybe you can play casually, but people just don't see it that way right now. They they still see Hall Breacher as a bad card. Bad card. I still see it as a bad card. I mean, I was playing a deck and I finally cast a Mangara and I couldn't draw oh, any true. cards with Mangara because there was just a, and it was in a, just a casual pirates deck. Yep. So it wasn't anything, it wasn't trying to be offensive no. or do anything crazy. Um, but but Shauna from Tap That MTG, she had so much mana. Mm -hmm. She was like, uh, I guess I make another because with Mangara, it's not May. I was drawing the card and she, I was like, all right, that's your second spell. Uh, Shauna, you make a you make a treasure because you have Hull Breacher out. Um, so that card, if it hadn't gotten removed, which the three of us worked together to remove it, mm -hmm. um, it was pretty painful because I don't even think it was just me that was losing. It was, we were all going to fall victim to that much mana for sure and it was it was interesting in that casual format though because it's not like the hall breacher was cast in response to a windfall or anything like that it was just casually cast out there as a pirate 
And all it did for me is it made me change what strategy I was doing for the rest of the game. I'm not going to play my card draw spells right now. I have to find a way to remove that first, which is something that you would do in a game of standard or a game of modern anyway. So the funny thing was that in that game, which had a, a, a Selesnia deck, what were I forget what you were playing. There was no Tremi deck, so there was Saltai. And mm-hmm. I don't remember exactly what you were playing. I don't either. But we had to we had to put one of those those the gold enchantments on it to force the whole breacher to attack oh, because that's none right. of us had removal. That's right. I had it in my deck. I just couldn't draw my path mm-hmm. or anything. Uh so or a fight card. There was nothing. So we had to force it to fight, and fortunately, all three of us mm-hmm. had enough to block it even if someone had to take the hit and do like a double block and you know it's a three two though it was getting but it was getting big because of that enchantment plus it was getting plus one plus one cards but i digress it was difficult to kill but killable killable nonetheless killable nonetheless nonetheless so i think i think playing and uh in these formats there's also been discussion um on cards that people don't want to play anymore because people are afraid to play like a brainstorm in like a competitive game true with hull breacher now mm-hmm. it's like i spend one blue and they get three treasures oops yeah but i think that's very much less common in i mean that's not going to happen in casual very often no no you're not going to have someone hall breacher out against your brainstorm i hope not in casual other well maybe if the opportunity is there but it's not it's going to be on turn 25 not on turn one <laughs> yes yeah. if you're brainstorming on turn 25 maybe you deserve to get hall breacher i don't know on turn 25 on turn 25 i don't know if i've ever made it to turn 25 turbo fog no you scoot before turn 25 I sure in, a tur- so. in a turbo fog game so um <laughs> speaking of turbo fog speaking of strategies mm-hmm. that maybe uh less than um mm-hmm, mm-hmm. less than desirable to play or play against mm-hmm. um we've we've i think i've seen an argument against every strategy online. <laughs> it's like well then what should someone play if you don't like voltron you don't like turbo fog you don't like combo you don't like Rian, you what should someone play and that's the real that's the real you know it's it's art themes art themes are actually the only ones that people don't get upset about until you cast a zealous construct and steal someone else's kiki jiki then they then maybe oh but that's about it sorry that was a very specific reference to a game that we played that is true remembering it and you won i did off of someone's kiki jiki yes i do remember that yeah so um specific strategies right so you're playing because you know that like my i know i always go back to it my noi and dar cannot mm-hmm. handle a sacrifice strategy if someone has a grave pact or a shatter gang bros or, or something like that. I just, I'm not going to make it right. I'm not going to get there. So I do run counter spells. And when I survey the table and I go, Oh, that commander is going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to counter the spell every time. And sometimes it's like right on the commander. Mm-hmm. I'm so sorry that I countered your commander four times. I, I just can't win if you have it. Yeah. I just had your, your commander says when this enters the battlefield, Noyandar loses the game. It's basically, <laughs> it basically <laughs> says that, you know? And so, um, I, I have to play decks or I have to put things into those decks when I know that it's a glass cannon deck that's going to die or crumble completely to one thing you have to put like a couple of cards to beat that strategy right now you're going you want to try to make those cards that you're adding in there again to be uh more widespread so instead of destroy target uh permanent called grave pact you know maybe that costs half a mana instead of one because it's so specific but you would play a card that says destroy target enchantment or artifact or return all you know all cards target player controls to their hand or something like that and it's like then they have to prioritize what they really want to do and if they're wide open um maybe you'll get the the other two players in the game to assist maybe it's not only affecting you sometimes and that's the worst when it's only affecting you oh yeah and you're like uh anyone help me it's like it's not really hurting me i'm really sorry and now you're kind of dealt with and that Mm -hmm. that's that's when it gets tough Mm -hmm. (laughs) um so we have some metagame dependent cards we were going to talk about kind of along with right with this strategy here yeah. so um we've got um i think one card one of the first cards that i thought of which is really metagame dependent um that might 
might go along with some of these less than desirable strategies mm. is like carpet of flowers. Mm. So carpet of flowers is an enchantment that says um, at your upkeep, uh, you may add up to X mana of one color to your mana pool where X is the number of islands target opponent controls. So, um, you know, some people have a less than desirable strategy to play against of counter spells. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, I don't really. So if they expect a lot of those and they're in the color green, um, you could add carpet of flowers. The struggle is... <laughs> no one ends up playing blue this card does app it doesn't do anything no unless you're in like an enchantment like they cared about casting an enchantment or having a permanent out but yeah no it's doing nothing if you're playing starfield and nyx this could be a one one there you go you you found the loophole it's one more it's one more uh devotion to green for you it's in a your devotion green to devotion green in your green devotion deck yeah so um i play carpet of flowers in very few decks. I had it in my Gore Maldrick deck, but I got very lucky that someone was actually playing blue in that stream. Mm -hmm. I just had it because that that deck, it was it was a card that I had because I opened some mystery boosters and there was a carpet of flowers. Um, very meta dependent. But yeah. I, I'm generally pretty safe saying that in games that we play on our stream or with friends, usually at least one person has blue. Most likely. Um, sometimes it's me though so that's true i think it's usually me <laughs> when we say that there's at least one person playing blue yeah um but carpet of flowers mm, probably doesn't work in everyone's meta right um so the next one on the list is one that i used to play and i no longer play and i'll tell you why and it's called aura shards so aura shards is a three cmc enchantment this is whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control you may destroy target artifact or enchantment um so I played Aura Shards in my Reese the Redeemed deck, which could create like 10 tokens a turn or 10 tokens per each person's turn if I had a Seedborn Muse out. Um, and it was a very effective strategy in making sure that no other player was e ever able to have an artifact or an enchantment ever again. And that's why I don't play the card anymore. It, it worked really well in our local group play group meta. And it just would make some people upset because they have an all artifact strategy. And it's like, well, this one card shuts down your entire deck. Yeah. And there was nothing that you could do about that. Nope. It was good if you wanted to get rid of like one artifact that was going to cause a problem. Mm -hmm. But when it also hit their artifact lands mm -hmm. and, you know, it was like, oh, this is this is actually a problem for this person. Right. And, and on top of it, it's kind of like a cascading effect, not literally keyword cascade, but um, in that you could destroy the aura shards. But if I've already done enough damage, I probably have 20 tokens on the battlefield now. So, right. so do you, uh, do you hate playing against mono white? Most people would say no, no. Do you want to play a card that destroys mono white? You could play flash fires. Let's just destroy all planes. Oh, that's exactly what mono white needs. Yeah, it's exactly what mono white <laughs> needs. Land destruction only against them. That is a very, I I don't understand <laughs> if this card. I don't know why you would want to run this. I guess if you're playing, but this seems like the perfect example for a meta dependent card. Mm -hmm. Are you playing against SRAM Senior Edificer and it is just running, you know, running crazy in your play group? Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to throw a four mana sorcery in to destroy all their planes. That's the only, <laughs> or a Tashar maybe. But I, in most bad. cases, I, I can't think of an instant where you would want to run destroy all planes. That seems not fun. No, you, I mean, I guess you could say that for, for most mass land destruction, especially the targeted stuff. Um, I know Andy, you had listed boil here as well, which boils also listed. I love running boil in my mono red cedh tech yeah so boil destroy all islands it is also uh this this also costs four but this one's an instant that's right in a red um destroy all islands this will probably do more damage than flash fires um well for sure because it's getting at islands instead of planes islands being more more popular um but again could be a completely useless card i mean it, it could be even useless sometimes in um cedh because there's decks that don't play blue and there's decks that don't play many islands. I mean, it's specifically looking at islands, not blue sources. So you never know. Could be a dead card. Right. Absolutely. Do you want to take an extra turn and do you play green, but not blue? Well, I've got a card for you. Okay. It's seed time and you can play it only during your turn. Uh, and if an opponent played a blue spell this turn. Okay. Yeah. Only on my turn and only if an opponent played a blue spell. Yep. Yeah. So I try to play Vorinclex and you go counter your Vorinclex and I go, okay, seed time. I'm going to take a new turn now. Yeah. Okay. But 
Now you have no opponents playing blue. Oh. Uh, I guess seed time doesn't do it. Seed time does not say anything. Yeah, yeah. Very metagame dependent card again. Yeah. Um, two cards that I actually like playing in my mono red decks. Uh, and I when we when we were going through these meta dependent cards, I was specifically looking for cards that I actually do play uh, in these decks. So um, red elemental blast and pyro blast uh, being mono red cards that cost one mana that either counter a blue instant or destroy a blue permanent are not very good if no one is playing blue. Um, I do like the fact that they can destroy blue permanents though, which is kind of why we're hating on deck. blue a lot tonight, but it's okay. We have lots of cards that hate on blue. We can take it down with blue, blue. players. Blue players can't take because they'll just counter it. <laughs> sure. They'll just windfall. We'll get a new hand. We'll try time spiral. Let's go. <laughs> um but yeah no i mean okay let's go outside of blue then let's go outside of blue hate um a card that i play in um in one of my decks is is insurrection uh so for seven cmc huge card five red 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 you know sorcery it says untap all creatures and gain control of them until end of turn did you say seven cmc and then say five red it's it's eight cmc that's correct (laughs) said it the whole time <laughs> it's fine well, can we roll what back word, the tape what word did I, H-M-C. what word did i say earlier you combined two different words together i know what was it again oh shoot it was like realize and recognize recognize and uh reckon recognition reckon and yeah and recognition <laughs> that's right so insurrection an 8 CMC sorcery for 5 red 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 says untap all creatures and gain control of them until end of turn. They gain haste until end of turn. This is a huge huge card that's going to be probably a win condition in a lot of things but it's meta dependent because what if people aren't playing creature focused decks or there's just not enough creatures on the board at any given time to be able to swing at everyone and kill them. Maybe you maybe you'll be able, only be able to kill one person with it or maybe Everyone is playing instant and sorcery decks or combo decks or something, decks that don't involve their commanders very much, where there isn't going to be a lot of creatures on the board. If you're playing in a meta like that, you're not going to be playing Insurrection, but you could probably bring Insurrection to a casual table and it would be very, very strong, a definite win condition. So it just depends on what your meta is. You could just ultimate your original Tibble, I think. Right, that's instruction on on that table. Mm-hmm. I believe the ultimate is minus for. So if that's you true. would like to also discard all of your cards randomly and then do that, neat. Yeah, and you can do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have I see listed as your very last card for today mm-hmm. is Deluvian Primordial. Oh yes, uh, actually I like all the primordials for this particular case. Um, but yeah, specifically the ones that you see are Sepulcher Primordial and Diluvian Primordial, which are searching for uh, Sepulcher Primordial, searching for creatures, and Diluvian Primordial, Primordial, searching for instants or sorceries in your opponent's graveyards. So if there's a rest in peace out where no one has a graveyard, if people are are playing their all creature gruel decks, and I have a Diluvian Primordial, you know you're all you know you're all creature gruel deck. Nikia. Nikia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's the name. <laughs> I couldn't remember it. Sorry. <laughs> um, my Diluvian Primordial isn't going to hit with you. Um, or if if I'm playing my Jorian deck, which plays four creatures, then the Sepulcher Primordial isn't going to do anything against my deck. In most cases, people probably are playing a balanced um, aspect of instant sorceries and creatures. So in most cases, they'll probably be okay. But there's definitely going to be times when these are meta dependent cards that just don't work for you. That being said, have you ever seen Sylvan Primordial played before? Because I've literally never seen it's this card. Banned. Dang it. You're not allowed to play it. That's why. It's, it's so best. good. I've ca- Yeah, because <sighs> you destroy three of their lands and you get three lands. It's not even fair. It's just destroy target non-creature permanence. Mm-hmm. It's it's a banned card. That's That would be why I never see it get played then. Yep. T T D. Today I learned T I L. I almost I almost messed that up. T D Ameritrade. What are you trading? I don't know what that is. This is a commercial for an investment group. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to be our sponsor, um, Coil <laughs> will buy Sylvan Primordials. Sure, deal. If you want to, if you become our sponsor, Coil will buy Sylvan Primordials. That's right. Interesting. Um, that's why you can't play that card. That's right. <laughs> um, 
tell us about your metas. If you have anything that run, runs uh, runs rampant or uh, you, you struggle playing, um, we would love to provide some suggestions. And um, did you ever, you know, um, over adjust to something mm-hmm. and, and shut it down? Because I think we've all done that. We've, oh, my deck can't beat seven sacrifice, you know, cards. Oh, or right. I can't, you know, I can't play against a, a deck that uh, allows me to, or doesn't allow me to cast things at instant speed. And right. then, you know, I, you showed my whole hand. Yeah. And then you, you have to start focusing on them. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. That's what yeah. you have to do. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's the end of the episode this week. Thank you all for listening. If you want to contact us, you can find our podcast online at guardianprojectpodcast.com. You can find our social media on Twitter at guardian pod and our gameplay videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash the guardian project. You can email us at guardianprojectpod at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at AT Flory. And I'm on Twitter at Worm Coil Engine. And of course, we always want to give a special thanks to our producer, Ryan Nichols. Flam, 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 flam. And also uh, a big old thanks to Chris Wolf, who handles all of our graphic design. Thank you, as always, to the both of you. And I guess we'll talk to you next week. Goodbye. Bye.